webcast is brought to you by Xtero. We are the only legal governance risk and compliance platform that brings together technology and automation to address the overlapping areas of data privacy, e-discovery, information governance, cybersecurity compliance, and digital forensics. So we welcome you to check out our solutions at Xtero.com. All right, let's kick off with some introductions here. Real briefly, my name is Rebecca Perry. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Xtero. I've been with the organization for over 23 years. I've been in the trenches with clients, helping them address complex data privacy, data governance, and litigation issues. I've been a certified information privacy professional for I think over a decade now, and really looking forward to the discussion pulled together a great panel for today. So Christy, you wanna give us some background? Sure. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christy Hawkins and I'm a partner with Ackerman's Consumer Financial Services Data and Technology Group in Dallas. Um, my practice focuses on privacy and AI at all stages of the life cycle, including front end regulatory compliance, risk assessments, contracts, you name it. Um, one of my favorite parts of my job is getting to bridge the gap between the technology and business functions so that we're all speaking the same language and that we're able to move forward toward a common goal with clear understanding from all stakeholders. Excellent. Thank you, Christy, for joining us today. And Jonathan, I'm super excited to have you join us um, and really bring sort of the in-house perspective, how you're thinking about these issues. So if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Yellen. I'm General Counsel and Executive Vice President for Charles River Associates. We're a leading global consulting firm uh, specializing in economic financial management consulting and headquartered in Boston. Uh, I've been the GC since 2004, and I'm very excited to be part of this panel. Um, and I too, like Christy, have to work with our internal constituencies to figure out how we're gonna best handle uh, using AI and all the various functions going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And Goli, thank you so much for waking up early and joining us today. You wanna to give some uh, background on yourself? Hi everyone, pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I'm Goli Madavi. I am a senior member of Brian Cave Layton Paisner's Global Data Privacy and Security Group. Uh, in that role, I provide strategic compliance counseling uh, in connection with domestic and international privacy and security laws. I'm also a founding member of uh, our firm's AI task force, and most recently have been working with uh, clients on the responsible development and deployment of AI solutions. And again, so happy to be with you all today. Excellent. All right. So AI technology, clearly uh, it's rapidly expanding around the globe in terms of innovation as well as adoption. And the landscape is, is increasingly complex. And so we put together an agenda that I think will touch on key points, regardless of where you are, sort of in your knowledge of AI. So we're gonna look at what is AI, some of the risks associated with AI. We're gonna weave in some ethical obligations to consider, uh, look at how AI is regulated, and then of course, managing those risks and some key takeaways. We do have a packed agenda today. I anticipate we will be using all of our time. Um, however, I would encourage you to go ahead and insert questions. We're gonna try to leave some time at the end for Q&A. If for some reason we're not able to get to questions, uh, we will look at those questions and, and try to get back to you individually if we can. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and kick off with what is AI? And Goli, I think you're going to give us a definitional primer to sort of set the stage for our discussion today. Yes. Yeah, so we'll do a quick review of some of the key terminology, just so that we're all working from kind of the same baseline conceptual understanding. And so really starting with artificial intelligence, what is artificial intelligence. It's really, it refers to kind of a broad set of technologies and there is no one universal definition for AI. It's been defined in many ways. I like to use the bread recipe analogy. There are thousands of bread recipes, but of course you have certain fundamental ingredients like water, flour, and yeast. And we think about what those fundamental ingredients are for AI 
we're talking about a machine system that simulates human intelligence to generate an output. And we, we've highlighted some of the, the commonly used definitions. And in particular, I wanted to flag the OECD definition because it has been adopted in the most recent draft of the EU AI Act. And so like the GDPR has set the language for much of privacy, we may see the OECD definition of AI uh, being adopted in um, future laws regulating AI. And so when we talk about AI, we throw a lot of technical, throw around a lot of technical jargon. And so here we're gonna break down some of the, the various layers of this technology. And so artificial intelligence really is an umbrella term and it refers to kind of a technology that, that uh, operates in an intelligent manner. And you know that's kind of the broader circle AI. And then of course you have in the smaller circles, different subtypes of AI. And Christy's gonna walk us through what some of those subtypes are. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's really important that we kind of start with the same vocabulary. So I'm going to go through a few of these and kind of try to set everyone's baseline. Um, so one subset of AI that we're seeing a lot of is machine learning. And this is what happens when we train algorithms to learn from data to perform a task we've given them. And when we train them with the data, they use that to, to learn and to find relationships and patterns in data and improve their performance over time. Um, now drilling down further, deep learning is a subset of machine learning and it uses artificial neural networks. Um, those are basically computer networks that are designed to mimic the structure and the function of the human brain. Um, so deep learning uses these neural networks to process and analyze data in layers so that one layer uses the knowledge of previous layers and they build on previous knowledge so that each layer can become more advanced without having to reteach everything. So for example, let's say I need a tool that can translate written text from English to Mandarin Chinese. Um, I can try to train my bottom layer to translate text. Uh, next, I want a tool that can write poetry, but I also want my poetry tool to be able to translate from English to Mandarin Chinese. So instead of teaching my new poem tool everything I taught the first one, I can just have my new tool learn from the bottom layer translation tool. Um, so I can keep adding layers instead of rewriting the previous models every time I need to add an ability or feature to a model. Um, and further down, generative AI. Um, this is an algorithm like ChatGPT, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, that can be used to generate new content. So if you see that AI is generating something like text or sound or images or videos, that's generative AI. And so tying these things together by comparison, um, with traditional computing, uh, the algorithm is applied to the input data um, to get the output. So this is sort of how you would think of a Google search. Um, you type in your search terms into Google, and based on the information available, the algorithm finds what's relevant and generates your search results, and that's the output. Um, but with machine learning, things change a little bit. So um, let's say we want to build a machine learning model that can predict whether an email is spam or not. So here we have the input data um, that would consist of various features or attributes of an email, like the sender, the subject, the body text, things like that. Um, the output would be a binary model. So this is something that indicates, yes, an email is spam, no, it is not. And the algorithm would choose a suitable machine learning algorithm, uh, like logistic regression or decision trees to train the model. Um, and to train it, we would need um, a data set that already we know, hey, this is spam, this is not. And so it can learn based on those features and adjust based on the feedback we give it that, hey, you've got this one right. Um, and then once the model is trained, we can use it to make predictions on new and unseen emails. Thank you, So Christine. those are some basics, yeah, for terminology. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'd, I'd love to bring Jonathan in now just to kind of talk about how you're thinking about this um, from a general counsel's perspective at an organization. What are, what are some of the things that I guess are keeping you up at night uh, about this type of technology? Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, 
So with all new new technology, I, I have to, to meet and work with all of our internal constituencies. And we have to assess uh, the, the best path to balancing value creation with, with risk management. Um, we have board oversight, especially now heightened with the new cybersecurity disclosure requirements that will be coming out uh, versus the let's uh, get going business generators. Uh, that balance is key and they're not always aligned. Uh, which path, which tools, uh, that's going to be the ongoing and changing debate. And that's what we do, uh, at least that's what I do as in-house counsel each day is I try to figure out which path do we need to go on and how to, as how to assess each of the constituencies' views and attributes. Yeah, and I think we'll get later in our discussion about how we can leverage sort of exist existing frameworks workflows, work streams that are already in place from a privacy perspective uh, to enhance that. So Christy, let, let's keep moving forward here and just look at some basic steps for AI development. Can you walk us through this? Sure. Um, I know this is a lot of my voice, but um, there's this one more chunk of information that I think is really, really important to have a foundational conversation about AI. Um, so walking through the basic steps of the development life cycle, um, before you create an AI model, you need to confirm what you want it to do and what you want it to accomplish. Um, this is how you really build a path forward and select your data and um, figure out what instructions you're going to need. Um, so right after that, we're going to look at data collection. Um, AI models need data to learn and to make predictions. Um, and what the model learns will depend on the universe of data that you feed it. So here we're looking at location and scope. Where are we going to get the information and what will the information include? Um, you know, what features do we want to be considered? Uh, for example, if I wanna create a model that can play chess, I'm going to wanna give it information about chess rules, moves and games, but I probably don't need to give it information about medicines prescribed by doctors for different illnesses. Uh, so after we collect the data, it needs to be analyzed before we use it to train an AI model. So here we would remove irrelevant data, like the medication data I just mentioned, um, and we would identify inconsistent or inappropriate data that we don't want the model to learn from. So my AI chess model doesn't need information about crimes that might have been committed by a chess champion. Um, and so then we change that data into a format that the AI model can understand and process. And this is programming, right? Um, next, we develop the algorithm that we're, that's going to define the instructions uh, that the AI model needs to follow um, so that it can analyze data and make decisions. And the algorithm and instructions are going to depend on your goals for the AI, like I mentioned. Um, and what you want it to do, like translating languages or beating the world chess champion. Um, now, after we develop the algorithm, we have to train it using the data we collected and processed. So we take the data that we collected and cleaned and hand it to the algorithm to read and process. And this is where the algorithm starts to adjust itself and to perform better or more efficiently. And this is where we teach it what the rules of chess are and what winning moves look like. Um, it's also where we start to minimize errors. Um, after training, we evaluate the AI model by having it look at new data that it wasn't fed during training. This is how we make sure it still works uh, with data it hasn't seen before. Um, so here, if the AI model can't apply the rules and the instructions to new data, we're going to repeat training and refine the model to train it better. Uh, finally, when it's ready, uh, we deploy it for people to use and then monitor it to see how it interacts with data. And we monitor it because we still have to make sure its outputs are accurate and effective. And this step might ultimately take us back to algorithm development or training to fix some issues that we spot. Uh, and finally, uh, AI models change constantly. So we need to diligently monitor them and improve them based on what we observe. Uh, we also need to keep evaluating our goals so that we can update or retrain when we need to. Thank you, Christy. A couple key things I think privacy professionals would pick up on here, data collection, data processing, where's the data coming from, whose data is it? Um, all kinds of questions I think that, that start to appear as we go through that development model. So that brings us to kind of our 
first ethical obligation. I think, Christy, you're going to walk through this, and then, Goli, you're going to add some commentary as well. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of, um, of ethics issues that we're presented with. Um, and, you know, focusing specifically on uh, legal ethics, uh, we've seen in the media that uh, there are risks of lawyers using AI in their work without fully understanding what's happening. So for me, this goes back to the basics. Um, are we saying that every lawyer needs to become an AI expert? No. Um, but there are a few key takeaways, I think, here. Um, so it, first, if a lawyer is using an AI tool in their practice, they need a basic understanding of how it works. Um, so, you know, if you want to run a search with chat GPT um, for case law on a particular issue, uh, here it's really important to understand that chat GPT isn't trained on present day data. So the cutoff is around 2021. Um, whatever is generated is going to be based on older information. Uh, but more importantly, maybe is the fact that chat GPT is not the same as a search engine and it doesn't work quite the same way. Um, so that might not be the right tool. Um, also, uh, before using an AI tool, we need to understand whether it's important that the information is accurate um, and whether there are limitations uh, to what the AI model can do. So uh, does it matter if the output is correct or truthful? Uh, if it does, then the lawyer needs to understand that AI might generate something that's not correct. Um, and so they really need to double check or avoid using AI in the first place. Goli, anything to add here? I think, you know, we've all seen the, the articles about the two Manhattan lawyers who uh, inserted fictional cases into a brief. Um, unfortunately, they became the poster child for kind of the um, incompetent use of, of AI. And, and it just highlights, you know, if you're going to use an AI tool to really understand what its capabilities are and what its limitations are, and then no matter what, there should always be a, a human review before anything is put out into the public or used. I think that's a great segue, Goli, to what are the risks associated with AI? So let's kind of break this down, um, put together a great graphic here that I think kind of highlights this. And I think you're going to walk us through a couple of those initially, Goli. So feel free yes. to jump in. So this list is not meant to be exhaustive. There are, of course, a lot of risks associated with this technology. Of course, we're highlighting here some of the, the big ticket risks, and I'll, I'll kick us off with privacy. Um, large language models are trained on vast amounts of data. I mean, sometimes we're talking about a petabyte of data. Um, and so there are going to be, of course, inherent privacy and security risks anytime you're talking about processing that amount of data, which has largely been scraped from the internet in, in most cases. And so there are really kind of questions around you know, reconciling the use of large language models and, uh, you know, privacy compliance obligations under existing frameworks like the GDPR. For example, if a data subject um, submits a deletion request, what, what is required um, and, and can you actually delete data from a model? I think kind of the prevailing view now is that you probably have to retrain the model in order to actually effectively delete the information. Um, so lots of questions around privacy and security. Um, also, of course, we have the you know potential unintentional release of confidential information. I think a lot of folks are jumping at the chance of using these generative AI tools, perhaps not understanding that if you're using the public instance, you are releasing that information back to the company uh, for it to be used, um, possibly in retraining the algorithms. Um, and that it may unintentionally be um, made public in some other you know prompt output. Um, situation. And so um, there are privacy and security risks. And then also with respect to IP, this is really an exciting time um, for IP lawyers. I'm actually a little bit jealous. Um, <laughs> there's this legal war being waged and so many open questions that the courts are just going to have to resolve over the next few years. And I think, you know, one of the big questions is um, when, you know, developers of, of AI tools train their models, on copyrighted data, is that a fair use? And, and we see that you know Sarah Silverman and other comedians have 
filed lawsuits against some of the major generative AI companies um, alleging copyright infringement because their data was scraped from the internet and used to train um, the large language models. So that's going to be playing out in the courts for many years. Also questions around, well, is the output um, copyrightable? Uh, you know, there are lots of artists that are using AI tools in really cool ways. And so um, there's a question as to to what degree um, those outputs um, that are kind of a blend of human and machine creativity will be um, eligible for, for IP protection. And, and I, I know that there's been a recent case where the Copyright Office provided a limited um, copyright protection to a comic book author who used generative AI to create some of the comics for the book. Um, and so that is going to probably be um, developing on a case by case basis and will really turn on, you know, how much involvement the human had in generating the output. Christy, you want to jump in with bias and transparency? Sure. Um, so one of the pillars, I think, of ethical use of AI is transparency. And for uh, all the privacy folks, we recognize that transparency goes hand in hand with the privacy notice, uh, which is required by the comprehensive privacy laws that we have today. Um, but explainability is also really important. So here we're asking, do you know enough about the AI tool to explain it to someone or to include it in a disclosure? Um, so bridging that, what does transparency really mean as it relates to AI? Um, we've talked uh, most of this time about how complex it is. Um, so does transparency mean that we have to describe everything the tool is doing behind the scenes? Um, there's not a consensus on what exactly transparency means in this context, but I think at this point, we know that we should at least be able to tell someone that the AI tool is being used or applied, um, how decision making takes place generally, and what the consequences might be for the person that we're talking to. Um, and now it's, it's also really important to consider the potential for bias. So when you're thinking about using AI, for example, in something like employment, you, you want to take a step back and consider what the existing rules are on things like discrimination when you're not using AI. So what can't you do? And of the things you're not allowed to do, is it possible that the AI model might do them? Um, you know, is the model biased because of how humans are training it? So for example, going back to the steps that, uh, that we outlined earlier, we saw that training is a really big one and you train based on data. So let's say a company wants to introduce DEI initiatives to help the company uh, be more inclusive in a meaningful way. Um, and the company decides to use AI to help identify uh, for new job applicants, maybe roles that they would be really good for. Um, you have a lot of successful people who've worked for the company in the past. So if part of the data that you use to train the AI is the data of successful past employees, then we really need to drill down here and look at the data. Is it overrepresenting certain characteristics um, or groups of people? Um, when your algorithm is finding patterns and relationships, like we said earlier, is it going to learn based on past data that the vast majority of successful job applicants are above a certain age or of a certain gender? So bottom line, when AI models learn, they learn from the data, so from past practices. Um, they can teach themselves to continue past practices if the issue isn't addressed. Uh, so models can teach themselves in ways that we don't intend. Um, and so we just need to be really mindful of you know, what data is there and the potential issues that we might come up against. Um, and I think starting from that baseline of what are we allowed to do and not allowed to do can help us uh, really address that in a thoughtful way. Jonathan, I think we have one more accuracy. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, we've all read about and seen uh, AI hallucination discussions. My, my top concern uh, is relying on these tools to generate the correct and accurate output. Maintaining a robust quality control environment is critical because uh, you have to confirm both the data in, as we've heard, and data out. Without this, you run the risk of unverified reliance on the accuracy of these tools 
with the goal of getting a faster result, which in the end is likely going to lead to higher litigation risks. And as in-house counsel, my my job is to try to mitigate, can't can't remove, prevent all, but mitigate uh, the increased risk uh, for litigation when using new uh, new tools and technology. Great points, and I think it also kind of raises you know, potential policies within the company on how to address these risks and what employees should be thinking about as well. Well, let's kind of look at um, some examples. I think we have a couple slides here of AI gone wrong, um, sort of as a, a learning opportunity. And Goli, I think you're gonna speak to these. Yes, so these three examples um, have been documented in the press and they predate kind of the current generative AI wave. Um, in 2019, an ad tech platform was sued by HUD and the ACLU uh, for allegedly allowing advertisers to effectively redline certain neighborhoods when serving housing ads by allowing the algorithm to use certain protected characteristics, protected characteristics in serving those ads. Uh, in the second example, a prominent tech company decided to develop their own in-house AI recruitment tool, and they train that tool based on their uh, a decade of their own resume submissions. Um, of course, those resume submissions skewed heavily toward male applicants, and the model learned to uh, favor male applicants over female applicants. And so female applicants ended up being downgraded where the model found um, certain terms within the resume that uh, like, you know, women's affinity groups and things like that. And then in the last example, um, there is, you know, quite a lot of evidence that shows that certain facial recognition technologies do not, um, have a good degree of accuracy when it comes to recognizing black and brown faces. And so just actually this week, the New York Times reported the sixth case, the sixth reported case of a false uh, arrest by law enforcement based on a false um, identification based on facial recognition technology. Um, and so the, these are kind of risks that we've known about for many years. Um, and I think Jonathan, you're gonna walk us through some of the kind of more emerging issues that have come out of generative AI. Thanks, Goli. Um, these are the headlines we've all been seeing. Uh, there's more out there, more to come, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, the risk of violating confidentiality of your business or your customers, IP infringement with resulting output, and as we noted, inaccurate results are just what keeps me up at night. Um, as the pressure grows to use more and more of these tools and resources, it, it's, it's my job and our job as legal advisors to inform our clients uh, that checking these boxes, uh, it's not glamorous, but in the end, uh, the, the business will benefit in the long run over those that are just going to speed ahead unabated. Uh, there is a lot of risk out there, but there's a lot of opportunity. And it's that balance that we just need to stay on top of. And I think that leads us to the next um, uh, ethical obligation, Jonathan, and you mentioned, right? Uh, discrimination, harassment. Can you talk us through this one? Sure. Um, so uh, the first focus we've heard before was uh, on, on people. Uh, we're a consulting business and uh, our hiring practices are what uh, may uh, be the first uh, uh, area of, of entry for these new tools. And, and we've seen what happens when Goli mentioned the earlier issues. Uh, I believe that uh, the, the New York City law on bias that we that is out there uh, on employment decision-making uh, is going to be followed in other jurisdictions. Uh, and I think uh, that Employment Council is going to look uh, closely at uh, various hiring decisions with an eye towards whether or not you are using tools that in the end are deemed biased and therefore create additional litigation uh, for your firm. Uh, that's, that for me is uh, at least front of mind when dealing with uh, the most current use of AI tools, uh, HR decision-making. And our next one, Jonathan, I know you mentioned confidentiality. Christy, I think you're gonna to touch on this and, and then Jonathan, you're gonna jump in. Right, um, so I think this, um, this really ties back to how an AI tool works. 
you know, the tool is trained on data that you feed it to generate your output. So if there's nothing set up to the contrary, the data you input into the AI, AI tool to get your output is going to be used to train going forward. So um, we can see problems, I mean, as, uh, as Goli mentioned, um, with inputting client data or inputting company confidential data, um, we really need to be able to understand what's going to happen to it um, and uh, really understand the scope of that so that we don't inadvertently, uh, you know, cause confidential information to become uh, part of uh, the training data for a model or even an output later. Yeah, I mean, from, from, from my perspective, uh, Again, as I said, confidentiality is the bedrock of, of the legal profession. Um, using AI tools that are not fully vetted uh, to understand how the data is stored, used, retained, runs the risk of violating not only this rule, but uh, various contracts you have with your clients. Um, recently, I've seen renewal terms where we just generally click through and don't think about it. And I'll read you a quick uh, a statement from one which said that they could reproduce, distribute customer content for the purpose of analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence and training in any way they wanted. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it scared me a bit. Uh, and do we need to consider revising our contracts to include informed consent uh, related to the use of these tools? How do we confirm that our cloud-based vendors are complying with confidentially obliga confidentiality obligations that we have? Uh, at a minimum, we need to ask these questions and look carefully at all the new language going on and being put into these renewal terms that we're gonna see on a daily basis. All right, we're gonna keep rolling along here and look at how AI is regulated. And Gartner just recently released um, a report on emerging privacy trends. And in that, it had a section on AI and governance. In fact, it's, it's woven throughout the report, but by 2025, they predict that regulations will necessitate focus on AI ethics, transparency, and privacy, which will uh, stimulate instead of stifling trust, growth, and better functioning of AI around the world. So I just find that uh, fairly interesting. But Goli, I think you're going to give us an update um, on kind of where we stand today. Absolutely. And I mean, of course, we've seen kind of wide adoption of AI tools um, across all industries, really, and regulators are, are sort of racing to catch up. And we'll probably start, we'll start across the pond in the EU because they have arguably made the most progress towards kind of a comprehensive um, legislation uh, specifically around AI. So we'll talk about what the EU draft AI framework looks like. But first, very quickly, the UK is taking somewhat of a diverging approach. They um, are setting themselves out as being very pro-innovation and they don't want to stifle innovation uh, through regulation. And so I, I think it's unlikely in the UK that we will see specific AI uh, legislation, although of course they will point to the fact that there are existing laws on data protection and competition and IP uh, that in, in some ways uh, do regulate AI. And so on the next slide, we'll get a little bit into detail on the EU AI Act. And of course, you really need more than an hour um, to understand this comprehensive legislation, but we'll do a very quick high level overview. The EU AI Act is based largely on kind of the product, the existing product safety um, regulatory regime in the EU. And so if you're familiar with any of those laws, you'll see a lot of the similar, a lot of similar terminology and concepts. It's really borrowing from kind of a product safety um, framework. And so the EU AI Act takes a, a risk-based approach and there are essentially four buckets that an AI tool can fall into. It's either prohibited, high risk, limited risk, or minimal risk. And depending on the, the characters, character of the AI system, it will fall into one of those four buckets and have some corresponding compliance obligations. So with respect to prohibited, currently uh, there are certain prohibited uses of AI systems. Th those include social scoring by governments, real-time biometric identification by law enforcement, and emotional recognition software used by um, used in border management. So that, that list is subject to change. Obviously, it's still a draft. 
but really the, the, the law is really aimed at addressing high-risk AI systems. And the law enumerates some of those high-risk AI systems, and they include biometric identification, AI tools used in employment, AI tools in education, and in the delivery of any kind of essential um, social services. Uh, also, the AI Act um, designates kind of any product that is already subject to the, to the um, product safety regime in the EU as a high-risk system. So we're talking about toys, gas appliances, um, watercrafts, medical devices, um, those sorts of things. And so if you have an AI tool that is high-risk, and you are a producer of that tool, there are certain um, fairly onerous compliance obligations that you have to follow. Um, firstly, you have to set up a risk management system that will allow you to identify and mitigate risk throughout the life cycle of that high-risk AI tool. There are transparency obligations, uh, requirements to maintain technical documentation, uh, the ability to describe, you know, in detail, what are the characteristics of this AI system? What are its capabilities? What are its limitations? Um, also rules around data governance, um, really to ensure that the data used to train the, the AI systems are of a certain quality and that they have been examined for potential bias. Uh, there's also a requirement of human oversight. The models need to be designed in a way in which uh, humans can uh, meaningfully exercise some oversight. And then there's the conforming assessment, which will be familiar under the product safety regimes. Um, companies will need to perform and publish an assessment. And then uh, assuming they comply with the assessment, they can then have a CE marking for their products. Uh, in the most recent draft, foundational models were specifically flagged. Um, and with respect to foundational models, they're kind of layering on additional requirements uh, those include disclosing whether any of the sources of the data uh, that the model was trained on were copyrighted, uh, being transparent with respect to the capabilities of the foundational model, the compute power, and so on. And so similar to the GDPR, the EU AI Act will have extraterritorial reach. It's going to apply to producers and deployers of AI systems globally. The, the fines, similar to the GDPR, are uh, quite high, particularly for the worst offenses. In terms of timing, we are in the trilogue phase. Um, assuming all goes to plan and the draft goes through the, the standard kind of legislative process, at the end of that legislative process, there'll be a 24-month transition period. So really, realistically, we're talking about 2026 for uh, the EU AI Act to go into force. But it's absolutely something to watch um, because again, it will have extraterritorial reach. Definitely something to keep our eye on for sure. All right, and so let's take a look at the US from a just a federal and state level. I think, Goli, you're gonna set the stage here and then we're gonna dive in to some specifics. Yes. So, you know, at the federal level, we know that there is no federal statute that kind of directly regulates AI. Uh, last year, there were attempts made. There were two bills, the Omnibus Privacy Law and then the Algorithmic um, Accountability Act, which would have regulated AI. Uh, neither of those um, bills have been reintroduced, reintroduced in this current legislative session. Um, but Senator Schumer recently had a press conference wherein he indicated that Efforts are underway. Uh, they're going to be holding a series of insight forums this fall. And his prediction is that, you know, federal AI legislation, at least in draft form, is months, not years away. Um, it, you know, in the meantime, the White House has been very active. They published at the end of last year the AI Bill of Rights, um, which unfortunately we don't have time to go into, but it's, it's a really um, useful document. I would recommend reading it. It sets out, it's obviously a non-binding policy document, but it sets out kind of the five main um, principles. And in fact, IPP's privacy Advisor podcast just interviewed one of the um, co-authors of the AI Bill of Rights. And so I would give that a listen because it's, it's a great kind of overview of what those five main principles are. 
and it really gives us kind of an insight as to what kind of future legislation would look like uh, at the federal level. And then at the state level, well, of course, we're all familiar with the, the patchwork of laws um, as privacy professionals, and that uh, remains the case. We have a patchwork of, of consumer privacy laws, and then it's also some use case specific laws that apply to AI tools. So I think this is a little bit of a breakdown for the federal oversight as kind of we see it today. Goli, is there something here you'd highlight? And Krista, I know you have... Um, uh, fondness for the FTC blog on, on this topic. So maybe just a quick run through of some highlights here. Absolutely. I mean, I think the key takeaway here is, you know, there's this narrative that AI is unregulated at the federal level. And I think the FTC and the other federal agencies have really been actively countering this narrative. You know, back in April, we saw that they published a joint letter and they expressed this collective concern um, that AI would be used for discriminatory and anti-competitive purposes. And then within that letter, they also emphasized that they have existing legal authority to go after bad actors and that really uh, under the existing legal frameworks, it doesn't matter whether a discriminatory decision is made by a human or rendered by a machine, that the laws will apply the same. And, and the FTC really is committed to enforcement in this area. I mean, we've seen probably their most impactful enforcement tool is algorithmic disgorgement. Um, and they've used that five times since 2019. So essentially, if a model has been trained on ill-gotten data, the FTC can enforce or, or require the company to delete um, any products that have been developed based on that ill-gotten data. And so that's a very powerful tool, potentially more powerful than just, you know, levying a monetary fine. Um, and so we know that the FTC and the other agencies are, are going, are, are committed to enforcement in this area. Um, so we should not, we should not uh, operate under the uh, illusion that, that AI is unregulated at the federal level. And Christy, um, what in the FTC blog uh, would you point people to specifically? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, generally they are very uh, interested in telling folks, um, you know, the things that, that Goli has just mentioned, that this is not unregulated. But specifically uh, in one post, it actually goes through some questions you can ask yourself, like as a business, uh, to help guide how you should be developing, using, and communicating about AI. Uh, things like, is this actually AI? Um, are you doing what you say you're doing? Um, that's pretty foundational for the FTC's enforcement. So it makes sense that they would bring it up here. Um, but I found the blog materials pretty helpful. I, I, I was curious, what uh, Goli, what do you think of the White House initiative on ensuring safe, secure, and trustworthy AI? What, what level of enforcement or oversight is gonna come from this self-policing policy uh, program? Right. Well, well, so two weeks ago, the White House announced that it had reached kind of a self-regulatory commitment, a set of eight commitments from the seven um, large generative AI companies. And so a lot of the commentary has been around, well, what is really the, the efficacy of the self-regulatory framework? And I think the key takeaway here really is that these eight commitments, which include, you know, watermarking generated content, um, investing in cybersecurity, uh, doing white hat hacking, uh, these really kind of set, set a blueprint, I think, or a roadmap for what future legislation will look like. And so I don't think this is the end all be all. I think the White House is, is this is part of a, a broader strategy um, around AI uh, regulation. Thank you. All right, I'm keeping an eye on the questions here and there was a great one that came in. Um, so thank you all for those questions, keep them coming. But given that AI uh, problems go beyond privacy risks, what is the panelists opinion on the role of privacy professionals in AI governance? Um, what is missing for privacy professionals to be able to turn into AI governance officers. And I think we're going to touch on that. So great question. Um, and I think this is a great slide to transition to now, Christy, to talk about um, sort of these state level regulations in privacy and how that kind of overlaps with AI considerations. 
Right. I think, you know, we're bridging the gap here and um, we do have the patchwork that Goalie mentioned. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to not forget as if we possibly could forget, we have consumer privacy laws currently effective um, in four states. Um, and there's a connection with privacy laws that I'm, I'm seeing folks kind of overlook. Um, and it is that AI is automated decision-making. So there are certain provisions of privacy laws that have different rules for automated decision-making and sometimes including the need for human intervention uh, in automated decision-making that's high risk or has significant effects. Uh, sometimes that's the requirement, right? And um, another connection with automated decision-making is that if it is high risk or has significant effects, um, it's likely going to trigger the requirement to conduct a data protection assessment to weigh the risks and the benefits and to see how we might be able to mitigate um, or eliminate certain risks. Um, but there also are some AI-specific laws that um, have come down the pipeline or are doing so. And one you may be familiar with, I think we've briefly touched on it, but the, uh, the New York uh, law on AI bias audits. Um, you know, that one is geared toward AI specifically and requires an independent bias audit to be done uh, where automated employment decision tools are used to screen New York City residents for jobs. And Goli, I think there's a couple more here we're going to touch on. Um, can, can you give us some highlights of these? And then we're going to transition into um, what can privacy professional legal teams do to address these risks we've been talking about? Yes. So very quickly, these are some, you know, very case uh, use case specific laws that not everyone may be familiar with. Um, in, in 2019, Illinois really led the way when they became the first state to enact um, restrictions around the use of AI in hiring and specifically the use of AI um, tools, uh, assessment tools during the course of a video interview. So the law requires certain notice obligations, um, uh, uh, obtaining affirmative consent, uh, the applicants or the interviewees have a certain deletion right, and then there are limitations on kind of third-party disclosures. Uh, somewhat similarly, Maryland um, has a law that went into effect in 2020 that uh, prohibits employers from using facial recognition uh, during the course of an, uh, of an interview for the purpose of creating a um, facial template um, without obtaining affirmative consent. And then California has a, a bot law that is not talked about very much. And it essentially the intention there is that when a consumer is in that in interacting with a bot uh, online, there should be some form of disclosure so that the consumer knows that they're not actually uh, interacting with a human. Uh, and, and we don't see many of these disclosures, I think, in the wild because the law has a very high threshold that applies to um, websites that have uh, 10 million or more monthly average users. And then uh, we see that there's some activity uh, in the insurance sector. So Colorado and California are uh, adopting rules to prohibit um, discrimination in insurance rate setting where the rate setting uh, is is done through like algorithmic and predictive modeling. All right, so keeping an eye on the time, we have 10 minutes left here to spend on what can organizations and, and you know, specifically privacy professionals do to manage these new and emerging AI risks. And um, I, I don't know if everyone knows, but I know that the IEPP has put together an AI governance group, a think tank, and they're putting out a lot of great content. And I just love this quote here because it really does sort of tie in um, this intersection between privacy and AI, trust, ethics, all of those things that we've been talking about. So privacy professionals have transferable experience, skills, expertise, that can absolutely be leveraged and built upon to help govern AI. And in fact, um, some of you may already be doing some of this work as uh, Christy pointed out, those data protection impact assessments. So let's kind of dive in here specifically. We've broken this into three categories here. And I'd like to just kind of take some time to 
touch on some of these key issues. So Jonathan, I know you talked about your internal constituencies. Can, can you talk us through some of these key points that we've outlined here? Sure. So we have the points on the slide and, and the way I look at it is, you know, the first, first issue is how do I manage my expectations um, of, and fear of being left behind, right? You have your groups and your various constituencies that want to um, move ahead as quickly as possible because they think that their competition is going to outpace them versus um, risk assessment. So for me, that's, that's the hardest part of the job. Um, the guardrails, what type of policies do I put around it? Who's involved in this discussion? Um, how often do we meet? Um, how do we meet? Um, what's the impact of reliance on these tools versus team creativity? Do people just start using AI and, and stop being productive as team members and, and creative? Uh, and, and, and the creative juices stop to flow? Um, how do you maintain quality control? Uh, again, all of them relate to the, the competing constituencies' goals of starting with, from our company, would be you know, oversight from the board level down to the ground floor of where the, the, the staff really want to make sure that they, they stay competitive in their various markets. And Jonathan, can you speak just real briefly to some of the key internal stakeholders that you're working with? on these issues? Who are your go-to folks to, to have these discussions sure. around the policies? Sure, well, uh, obviously we start with the board. Uh, I present uh, to the board with an enterprise risk group. Um, we also have an internal AI uh, group that's been established using vo both corporate and consulting staff so that we make sure that we have all of the constituencies in the firm involved from IT to um, HR, to legal, uh, to consulting staff, to financial administration. So all of them are involved because they each have a stake in it. And That's really, yeah. yeah and, and trying yeah. to make sure that we meet uh, on a regular basis has been key. Excellent. Christy, can you walk us through customers and third parties? I know that there's a lot <laughs> here, but I think third parties uh, seems to be coming up um, a lot in these discussions. Yeah, it really, um, it's, it is becoming um, a lot more important, I think. And, you know, if you're engaging a third party to implement AI tools, there are a lot of considerations that really we need to be careful to not overlook. Uh, you know, do they have policies and procedures in place for handling the AI lifecycle? Um, if you or they are inputting anyone's personal data into the tool, uh, what does the notice look like? You know, has, has notice been provided? Do we need to update it? Um, and the use of AI really needs to be incorporated into diligence and oversight processes um, if it's relevant. Um, and going back to that AI lifecycle step of continuous improvement, um, there need to be regular reviews uh, scheduled to incorporate updates or lessons learned. And so we, we need to do our homework and make sure that the folks we are engaging to, um, to develop these things for us are doing it responsibly. Um, and importantly, though, I love contracts. Um, one thing I am seeing a lot more often is uh, in vendor contracts, like Jonathan mentioned, I have seen those words. And uh, the first thing that we can do to, you know, to better prepare ourselves for these is look for them, right? Like look for these provisions in the contracts, keep an eye out for contract terms that allow vendors to use personal data to train AI algorithms. Um, you know, is it permitted? Do you need to update your privacy notice? Um, and are you even okay with it at all being used to train a model? Um, and so back to basics though, we need to start with big picture. You know, what is the vendor doing? Um, and one thing that we see is that not every claim about using AI is actually using AI. Uh, so for me, this means having a conversation with the technical folks, um, with the vendor, and hopefully being able to follow it. Um, you know, are they able to exclude our data from the data that's used to train the algorithm? And, you know, briefly touching on the question Rebecca mentioned, I think this is part of where we get to start bridging the gap. Um, and it's really cool. 
Awesome. And here's what I think uh, some of the audience has been waiting for, right? You know, where's the intersection of privacy? And, and we've been talking about it, I think, throughout, though. But how can we leverage these existing frameworks? Goli, can you give us some highlights here? Sure. I, I think kind of it can sound really daunting when we think about, OK, what, what is AI governance? How do we how do we adopt AI governance for for our organizations? And I think as privacy professionals, we are so well suited um, to to take on this job. I know we have a few other things going on as well. Um, but when you look at kind of the tenets of responsible AI, we're talking about privacy, security, transparency. There are so many parallels with with uh, privacy work. And, and so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, that's the good news. We can leverage our existing privacy compliance program and layer on kind of AI concepts. We can layer them on into our vendor due diligence process. We can layer them, them on into our DPIA process. Um, and I think if we have time, we'll talk about kind of more about what that looks like on the next slide. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump there, Goli, just so we can kind of continue because I think a lot of those concepts are outlined here. Yeah, I think, um, you know, going, looking back at these principles, right, as privacy professionals, we are familiar with these. You know, we have transparency. What do we tell people and how? Um, purpose limitation. You know, we talked about goals. Uh, these are crucial. And tying back in with privacy principles, um, in order for there to be proper data collection and use, there has to be disclosure. Uh, and that includes the purposes, uh, you know, data mi minimization. Um, can we avoid using personal data altogether? Um, you know, y'all recognize uh, these principles. Um, and then practices, right? We need to understand um, our AI inventory. What are we doing and how? Um, I mentioned, I think we all have, uh, the data protection impact assessments. Um, those are things that we have been doing for a while and that can be adapted and that will need to be adapted, um, along with privacy notices and data subject rights, the difficulties there. Um, but there is overlap here. I'll just flag quickly, you know, it and it, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach. I mean, obviously, you know, if you conduct a data inventory with respect to how your company is developing or deploying AI tools, um, you can start to risk rate those use cases um, and then really kind of tailor your AI governance program um, to, to how the organization is actually using AI tools. Um, so definitely, you know, I think the first step in the process is to really get your arms around what is it that we're doing um, with AI technologies. That's great. And, and how does that impact some of those business processes um, that we've outlined? Um, Christy, I know you, you put together this sort of a checklist slide here and with one minute left, and we've got one more slide to cover. So hopefully people will hang in there with this, but, but can you kind of explain how people might use this? Yeah, I think, you know, going back to Goli's point, um, this, uh, things need to be tailored. And in, in order to do that, we need to look at what exactly we're doing. Um, I've had a really fun time doing a deeper dive into what AI impact assessments will look like. Um, and so not exhaustive, but these are some of the things that you might need to consider in an AI impact assessment. So describing the tool, identifying stakeholders, um, necessity and proportionality, how are we using it? Um, you know, what are the risks? Um, and then using that to inform our decisions. Um, what are the legal requirements? And, you know, what are some opportunities to identify some of the serious risks? Um, so very similar to some of the things that we consider in DPIAs currently, um, but we can adapt that um, to leverage these processes. That's great. Thank you, Christy. And I'll start to bring us home here. So, you know, that that's something Xterra was doing in our, our privacy technology is layering in um, these AI elements as part of those existing work streams. And it's part of our compliance trifecta approach that we talk to our clients about. And it starts with that data inventory. So understanding um, and articulating those AI development and deployment principles um, ethical and regulatory obligations, and then, you know, that audit trail, the accountability. So say it, do it, prove it. 
Um, I would also just um, invite folks, I put a link in the chat to a white paper on our com compliance trifecta approach. So I would encourage you to check that out. All right, I wanna say a quick thank you to Christy, Jonathan and Goli for your time today. Amazing discussion. We really packed a lot into an hour. I think we covered some of the questions that came through. So thank you all for your time.